Hello, this is Dr. Jack Myers. Welcome to Jack Myers Ministries and Life Family Church Podcast Channel. Be blessed by this message. So uh, go with me this morning to Jeremiah 29, 11, and if you'll put up the, the sermon graphic. So um, this is the first time I deliberately wrote a two-part message. So whether you have to come back tonight or later, we'll, we'll see what the Lord... I'm planning on doing part two tonight, but um, if the Holy Ghost wants to change that, he can. But uh, so specifically, I think the Lord told me to slow down. Now, he didn't say all the time. I'm going to keep giving you your money's worth. <laughs> but uh, on this, because there's five points, he wanted me to uh, sort of dig deep and it would be more memorable. So it is going to be a two-part. But a lot of times, have you ever heard people say, you know, I, I just want to go up in life. You know, I want to go up the corporate ladder or, you know, uh, you want to be promoted. You want to go up. Who doesn't want to have everything go up and succeed in their life, Right. But there are just five specific keys that we're going to have to operate in because, you know, God has actually authorized you to have that and to do that. But um, for every promise in the word, there's a condition to fulfill, right? And there's an instruction to follow for every prophecy. The Bible calls this the entire book a word of prophecy. So what we want to look for is we go, thank you, Lord, that you've authorized me to constantly go higher and higher. But, but the question is how, right? And so we want to know how we need to, how we can do that because uh, the only person that uh, is authorized legally to be in your way is you. Satan is not authorized to be in your way. He's not legally authorized to be in the way of the believer unless the believer just lets them. So I, what I love is this is so easy and quick to just deal with the devil. If I've let him come out from under my feet, you know, get, get your shoe and write some scripture on there. And these shoes are made for walking. Yeah. And we're going to walk all over him. And so uh, we can, it's so quick and easy to fix that if we've let that slip. The, the, what we do oftentimes, though, is we focus on that, the enemy, as if he is our greatest problem and not the argument we have with me, myself, and I, (laughs) every part being. And so uh, it is the man in the mirror. I know Michael Jackson had a song on that, but that part of it at least was true. It's the man in the mirror. And so what God is uh, giving instruction in his word is on how we can, uh, maybe we could say get out of our own way or uh, allow the word to overcome ourselves. Would you say that you're probably your biggest problem? If you were honest, if not, you might need some shock therapy. (laughs) So um, we have to grow up spiritually, you know, to be a blessing to ourselves. When you are not spiritually mature, you are not a blessing to even yourself. Uh, So to be a blessing to others and the church and the kingdom of God, certainly we would have to grow up spiritually, right? Because uh, we, we want to have the overflow. It's the uh, more than enough that flows from the inside of us to the outside. So uh, if we're going to go up, the first thing, uh, there are five things though, that we're going to have to stand up. So we're going to look at that. We're going to have to listen up. In the military, they use the word attention. In the church, listen up. We want to listen up. Uh, Then we're going to learn to stand up, speak up, and grow up. So it goes in an order because if you get it out of order, it doesn't work. But a lot of times we want to um, run to the nearest Facebook or YouTube exciting message that made us feel better about us now. And what we're doing is trying to circumnavigate the process. And it doesn't work that way. I remember when I was uh, wanting to learn how to, how to run without getting a cramp. Not, I wasn't even at that half marathon place yet. I just wanted to run and not get a cramp. <laughs> Big goals. And so <laughs> I got a Runner's World magazine because the first thing my brain does is, well, let's, we didn't have Google yet, people, okay? And so you had to actually purchase a magazine or go to the library. Yeah. And so I got a copy of Runner's World 
magazine and I took it to work. So on my break, I'm thinking, well, these people know how to run without getting a cramp. So we'll just figure out what they're going to say about uh, how to breathe properly or, or write form. And I had it laying closed on my uh, work table in the place that I worked at. I worked for Have a Tampa Cigar Company. This was way back when I was 23-ish, 22-ish. And um, so I worked in the paste room and these machines were really loud and I had my little boom box. It was pink, yes, but it was playing like like ACDC and whatever, because the whatever I played had to be louder than the pace machines. And so you couldn't come back there and talk to me, which was the intent. <laughs> Sorry, introvert dreams. Um, and so uh, the engineer w would come through uh, that room and he would go into this side room. There was a shower uh, because he was working on, he would work on the machines and the bushing. My job was to count parts and things like that. So I still, to this day, I know what a bushing is, but I don't know exactly what it does, but I counted them all. Okay, and so uh, he noticed that there was the copy of a Runner's World magazine on my table and he... Uh, asked me about it, uh, Armando Garcia, Al, and uh, of course he's in heaven today, and he said, I see that, you know, are you runner? I said, well, I, I kind of would like to be, and he was letting me know. He said, I run, you know, on weekends I run to Clearwater and back. <laughs> um, 30 miles on a banana and orange juice. I was like, okay. It's awesome, and he just kind of took me under his wing. He actually hired me, and I moved out of the paste room and up uh, I was moving on up. I moved on up to the, what they call the white collar room and uh, worked up there for him in his office. But uh, he mentored me at a time in my life that I was at that place at that story that I said, God, if you have anything to say to me, you have 60 seconds, go. That was the place that he sent Armando Garcia and, and Runner's World. But see, God had a different run and a different race in mind. Amen. But what I was saying is, uh, he's the one that taught me, it was a breathing issue, and he talked to me about it, and I'd go out on my lunch break, and I would run the path in Brandon down there, uh, there was a path that you could walk on, and I would take my lunch break, and I would uh, practice the, the breathing skill, because it didn't matter how much you worked out at the gym, or how, how strong your legs got, how fast you thought you could go, how strong, how lean you were, you are not going anywhere if you don't have air, Okay, I don't, I don't care what, what you're doing. You're not going to get down the block. And so I, you cannot circumnavigate. You can't go buy the cute outfits and the colorful shoes and, and all the things and get, the, get a subscription to Runner's World and do everything else to make the outside all decorative and delude yourself into a wannabe runner. And you can't, you can't get the stitch out of your side. You can't get any air. Okay, because you don't actually need all those clothes. You'll figure it out if you actually run. You don't need any of that stuff uh, for a long, long time. And so we don't want to circumnavigate the order God puts things in and how he tells us because he's the one that authorized, designed, and created our success. So he gives us the order with which we can succeed because that's what he desires. And we need to understand that he's smart, we not. <laughs> just, just follow the plan. We don't need to go, oh, that's a great plan, but I think I can improve on it. Yeah, don't, let's don't do that. That may be, apply to a lot of other things, but not to God's word, amen? amen? So this is a path that if followed, it leads to success. But I would tell you this, any path that you make temporary will lead to temporary success. So what people do is they'll stay on a path for just a little while, and then they'll be like, okay, I have a, a measure of success. What you mean is you achieved a measure of relief from the pressure that drove you to the church in the first place. And then you start coasting. But anybody knows in business, if you don't do more than what you did to get there, it goes like this. So when you get there, wherever you call your there, you, people stop doing even what they did to get there, but there requires more because there's no such thing as staying still on the side of a mountain. Amen. Yeah, or what, uh, up, you coming down this side. So if you want to keep on going up, you stay on this path. If you think you've gotten to number five, repeat Repite, por favor. 
<laughs> One, two, three, four, go back. Hebrews, don't let it slip. We're going to go back. So every time I would go for, run the next mile and the next mile, my mind is, is telling my body again, focus on your breathing, focus on your rhythm, focus on what's important, not going on around me. If you can have a conversation when you are running, you are not doing it right. Because all your air and all your focus uh, has to be on keep going up. Keep it coming up, right? Don't stop it now. I'm going to make that your th theme song. So in other words, don't get to some sort of plateau and think that you can go, oh, isn't this nice? Because like I said, if you ask anybody in fitness, you lose it twice as fast as you gain it. So people are like, oh, they were doing so good. And then we see them 30 days later, later on dancing on top of the bar. That did not happen overnight, but it does happen faster because whatever you gain that you don't hold on to, you lose twice as fast as you gained it. So it's a principle in the earth and it's a spiritual principle. Amen. So God's designed us to receive a continual increase, but notice this, it's not asking God to give us the increase, it's asking God, when we say, bless me, that is not God, gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy. When you ask God to bless you, like the song says, you are giving him permission to position you to receive blessing. Amen. Because the fact that you have to be asked to be blessed means you are not, or not to the level you want to be. So God will reposition you or position you. That means there's going to move it, move it, move it. Stop shoving me. Stop pushing me. Then move. Yes. Yeah, and you won't feel somebody pushing you and shoving you. You're holding, holding up the line. I do, I do a lot of flying, and so you always have people. <laughs> and the attendants try to be nice about not holding up the line while you're trying to, special you verse, trying to shove a mattress up in the overhead bin, and you have a depth perception issue. And a dead yak and a floor lamp. Oh, well, let's see if that'll fit. Yeah. And, and, the, and there's a hundred people trying to get on the plane and not like we don't have anywhere to go, but yeah, let me help you with that dead yak that you, you thought was a carry on item. And so, um, uh, God has authorized us, but, uh, it is our job to seek him on that. Amen. Okay, so let's just read. You know this verse uh, well in Jeremiah 29, 11, but I want to read uh, more than just that one verse. Let me, you probably turned there eons ago. Let me get there. Because we like to quote certain verses that we think are God's obligation. We remind God all the time of his promises, um, but sometimes we forget to read above it and below it for our part. So Jeremiah 29, uh, 11, we know this, but, but uh, verse 12 gives us some instruction, uh, and so does 13. So let's just read 11. He says, this is God talking. He says, I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you. But that word thoughts mean his intentions towards you. So who knows? He knows. And we know that he wants you to know based on Ephesians, what? That you might know. So he, has, he knows them, and he wants you to know. We can check that off, right? Says the Lord, thoughts and plans for your welfare in peace and not for evil, to give you hope in your final outcome. That means uh, your latter days. We don't have to uh, be, be hopeless as we age in the natural or we go on in, in the line of time. Plans for welfare and peace. Then you will call upon me. So here's an instruction right here. All right, what are you leaving uncalled for? It's uncalled for, so you don't have it. Okay, so he says, then you will call upon me and notice that and uh, is actually is a power source. It's co-joined. Uh, it can't be separated. You're gonna call upon me and what? Come and pray to me. This is why we have Tuesday night prayer because it's a lot more fun to pray with other people and pray for other needs than your own. Because when you sow in prayer, you reap an answer. So the more we're at corporate prayer, the less time I find I have to spend on personal prayer, literally almost none. 
because if I even think of uh, things to pray during the day or I don't think of them, the Holy Ghost speaks them to me and they drop on you, pray them out. 95% of them are for other people and other things. Why? Because uh, provision is on my place of assignment. So when I'm walking on the path of destiny and obedience, I'm not praying for all the things that were out there because he said, seek first the kingdom and all the things would be added. So if I'm in the place of supply, I don't have to have all this long prayer list for the things that I need and want because I have them. So now I can spend time calling on God and coming to pray, not for me, but for his plan in the earth, which involves everybody else, right? Okay, pray to me. And and he says, then you will seek me and inquire for me and require me as a vital necessity. You know, when um, the COVID era hit, I should call it, there were two things that we all figured out that were a vital necessity to everybody. The number one vital necessity was water. We had to scramble to get it, didn't we? The number two vital necessity, toilet paper. Who knew? (laughs) And so God is saying, you understand from COVID, vital necessity. So this language is now, oh, require me as your vital necessity. So you thought bottled water, number one to live, which you would have been right because you can't go that long without water, and toilet paper, number two. God wants to be above bottled water. He, in other words, I cannot live without you and I refuse to. Amen. But you know what? Because I'm a cheerful giver, God says, and I refuse to live without you. Because the Bible says he refuses to live without a cheerful giver. And that's just not in money. That's a cheerful giver of our time, our talents, our money, uh, anything else that is asked of us. Yep, you can have it. Is there anything else you need? Cheerful, happy to do it. Why? It's not mine anyway. You just requisition what belongs to God. Okay, and he says, then what? Verse 14, I will be found by you. So if we do these things, what? We're found by him. And he said, do it with all your heart. Sometimes we're like, I am doing it with all my heart. And this is what sometimes I ask people, do you love God with all your heart? Yes, yes, yes. Do you love him more than you love yourself? Because that's all your heart. And I think sometimes you have to stop and go, God, I'm picking you, I'm picking you over me right now. Or at times, I actually pick me over God. Anybody here besides me ever pick themselves over God? Then we're not loving him with all of our heart. Yeah, that, that word heart is not an emotion to God. That is an action. He said, if you love me, obey. That means it's measurable and tangible to him and everybody else. And there are times when God wants us to do things that we know will bless him and others, but our flesh doesn't feel like doing it. That, it's, it's, we are proud to be Americans because we are to be part of the land of the free and the brave. But that freedom was not for us. And so uh, every time when you have a choice to pick yourself or God, just remember that freedom was not for you. The freedom that Christ set you free was for others. Amen? Okay. So we're going to talk about showing up. The first thing you have to do to go up in life is show up. Go with me to Hebrews 10, 24. And I'm just going to take my time and we'll finish where we finish. And then we'll finish the rest later. Amen? So if you're wondering what's on the menu this morning, it's always... Chateaubriand for two, not just steak, Chateaubriand. If you don't know what that is, Google it. Okay, and if you haven't had it, I suggest you do so you'll understand me better. (laughs) Hebrews 10, 24 says this, let us consider and give attentive, continuous care to watching over one another. This is the Amplified. Studying how we may stir up to love and helpful deeds and noble activities. So what is it saying there? How we may stir up, stimulate, and incite. Some people are inciting some things, but it's not love. (laughs) So in other words, you have the ability to incite something in another person. God instructs you to be purposeful in what you're inciting. He says, consider, give attentive, continuous care to watching over one another. So people are like, "Why why do you guys post, or the staff, or whoever's doing all the posting? Uh, people's Facebook that we haven't seen in a while, this verse. 
give continuous care to watching over others. Why do you have to reach out? Because they're not here. There are some people that say they go to churches with pastors and those pastors don't know those people. Oh, I didn't know they went here. I thought they visited here because I don't see them often enough and no one reaches out to them because they don't know they're missing because they have a six-week schedule, a four-week schedule, a two-week schedule, or no schedule at all. And a pastor doesn't know he's supposed to take oversight of their soul because he doesn't see them. And even if we see people, pastors sometimes, they don't know them because they don't know, the Bible says, know those that labor among you. That means I can't know you unless you labor among me. So they're not here putting their hand to anything. I can recognize a face, but I don't know who they are. I don't know if they're in the sheepfold, out of the sheepfold, they're visiting, not visiting, just being a visitor in general to the body of Christ, amen? And so nobody can take oversight of their soul and help them, but uh, the body uh, a lot of times is better at some of that as far as just saying, hey, come on back in to the sheepfold and join us because they sort of uh, can mingle a little bit over coffee. So uh, this verse really just means bring friends, right? Give continuous care to watching over one another. And it says to study how we might stir somebody up. Anybody ever heard of the five love languages? We have it in the resource center. We teach it here. It's not because we're bored and we need to have, you know, a fashion show or a tea party. I'm not interested in that. Never was, never will be. I'm interested in the word. Um, but I teach the five love languages because God created them. He created us with uh, all f- the need for all five on the inside of us. They're represented in him, therefore they're in us. But everybody has a dominant and a secondary For instance, uh, my dominant love language with others is uh, acts of service. So if somebody comes alongside and they help me paint or vacuum, whatever, I I feel loved. My mother-in-law's was she she liked gifts. You could get her a gift. And and that was wonderful for me because it was difficult to uh, express love to her. And then when I figured that out through the book, I was grateful that that she would know that she was loved because... uh, she would be okay with me telling you she's in heaven that she was difficult. I'm sure she found me is equally difficult. And so we'll rejoice together later. <laughs> iron sharpens iron. woo Yeah. And so um, and she was good, good. Nobody was that good but her. And uh, so anyway, hats off, right, when you're that good. And so uh, what we want to do is uh, the Bible says here in the Amplified to study each other. And so that means if I'm going to love somebody, I want to pay attention to how they feel loved. In other words, I'm not thinking about me. Uh, That's why we study personalities. Ephesians says for you to look well to your personality. By doing so, you will save yourself and those who hear you. That is a very serious verse. Saving your soul, not your spirit, right? God saves your spirit, you save your soul. But by paying attention to your personality and not ignoring it or not just going, well, they can just take me or leave me. I wouldn't give that choice if I were you because everybody's going to know what they're going to pick, yeah. And so uh, we're to look well to it. What, what that meant is your personality was to be used for God as a blessing, not against people and yourselves as a cursing. And so we had to look well, but that's part of why we study these things here in the helps team. And at different times of the year, obviously not on a Sunday morning, generally, occasionally we've done that on a Sunday morning, but it's because the Bible says uh, we're to know people, yes, after the spirit and not after the flesh, but if we're in here being self-absorbed, that does, does not make a good military unit when you get to the battlefield. They don't know each other was speaking with uh, the gentleman going on the mission field uh, with us, uh, Mr. Gabe and Mr. Rocky and Mr. Matt, who's with Pastor, and about training for security, media security, security issues. And I said, when you get on the mission field, uh, that you will understand in that short period of time, everything we do here makes sense at this military base of training. And one of the main things you'll discover is we could be standing this close to each other on the crusade field, and I could talk at volume 10, and you would need to read my lips. Mm -hmm. You would not hear anything. I could scream at the top of my lungs. So therefore, there will be no verbal instructions. People are like, do you have walkie-talkies? What fur? (laughs) You will not hear me, and I will not hear you. Forget the cell phone or the walkie-talkies. And we can't land a 747 with charades and hand signal. They think we're interpreting the service for the deaf. (laughs) 
I'm trying to communicate something over there. You have to know somebody well enough to know that when I, I don't even have to raise an eyebrow. I have a look that says, take care of that. I trust you. Whatever happens here stays here. <laughs> Take care of business, yeah, or a head tilt. And they have a look. We understand why. Because we're a unit, a family, brothers and sisters, a military. You don't take people who don't understand this look, what it means, and its full interpretation, in its full accuracy, onto special forces. You don't. You don't even take them into outreach here. This is special forces. You can stay a private, or you can be a sergeant, or you can be a general, or you can do black ops. It's all up to you, right? Amen. How far you go up is you, amen? amen. And so we, we train, why? To be ready, to be instant in season for whatever the Lord may, may call on us, okay? So th- this is important. So verse 25, let's bump over to the King James, says this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but obviously what w- we people hear this verse a lot and they go, oh, pastor's always harping on being in church. Uh, no, it's not just about being in the house of God, but most certainly it is about your physical presence in this room. Or in the church building, not connecting online. That is a disconnect. That is a a temporary measure for someone that maybe is in the hospital or recovering at home or is at a distance uh, they cannot get here, such as overseas or whatever. Thank God for, for the ability of technology to be able to communicate at great distances or people would have nothing at all. But when God has placed us in a body as he has, we are to show, show up in person. That's what we're talking about. You have to show up in person. Amen? Amen? So it says, not forsaking the assembly. Well, that word forsaking means this. Leave behind in a place. Leave down. Be absent in lack and wanting. So that means you left behind the place. The number one assignment on your papers from the captain of the host of the Lord Army when you open up your papers private is a geographical location. And you are not to be AWOL, absent without leave from that location, or you will be court-martialed. And so, or in the body of Christ, well, God, we're under mercy of grace. That's right, we are. So if you are AWOL, there will, be, there will not be the blessing, because the blessing is provided at the place of assignment. It's a storehouse. It exists somewhere, okay? There's food at Walmart, but I have to go down there and get it. it there is a geographical location that items like water and toilet paper are being stored, So you either have to have it brought to you or you have to go there. Now, I like stuff brought to me. It's a lot of fun because I don't like to shop. But but you know what? I don't like other people making choices for me. So every now and then, I just got to go see what's on the shelf because I don't make lists when I go to the store. I just go up and down the aisle. Yeah, 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 yeah. I knew that. Because how many of you have made a list and it didn't even get there? Oh, the list is on the shelf. Great. So this is the list. And this, this is the list. I just go up and down the aisles, and I don't take pastor with me or the cart ends up full of Doritos and, and <laughs> peanut M&Ms. There's, there's no room for my plain M&Ms. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got to throw him under the bus. We both, we, everybody's got their stuff, right? So it says, when you leave behind in a place, notice the Greek says you leave it down. You leave lack and you leave it wanting. The reason your life, the lack and the wanting will show up in your life because you sowed it. You made it about you. Well, I don't feel, or I feel, I don't feel offended, or I feel moved in this direction. And so you left the place God assigned for your blessing. Let me help you. It's generally the one you wouldn't have picked because it's what you needed, and we're not that smart. (laughs) It's not going to appeal to your eyes, your ears, your flesh. And if it does for a little while, this is what we hear. It's so wonderful. It's so loving here. Yeah, get up now and do the dishes. (gasps) Oh, you wanted to be treated like the, a guest permanently instead of family or a visitor. And so we will show, as you wish, we shall treat you like that. But you want to hang out. In the, you, you know when the best conversations are? After dinner when we're doing the dishes. Yeah. And everybody else is being lazy or sitting there or gone home. Same thing in this church. The best conversations are when we're here during the week and we're in our t-shirt and we got the weed whacker out and we're trimming the bushes, and we're pulling weeds, 
and we're painting the walls and we're getting a pizza together. So oftentimes people are like, well, can you, do you have time to mentor me? I sure do. I hope you're good at painting because I'm painting the wall today. And, and if you're not, you better bring lots of coffee. I'll, I'll, I'll paint and you make the coffee runs and you can ask me anything you want, but I'm painting the wall. Yeah, because the wall's got to get painted. And so we leave that behind. We're wanting the assembling of ourselves together. That word assembling together is a complete collection in the same place at the same time. Anybody ever had a set of china or a, a set of tools, man, and you were missing one? You do not have a complete collection. And for some people, that really bothers me. I was at my mom's house the other day and they had a puzzle on the table and she was telling me about it and it was all finished and I walked through the dining room and I saw a piece missing. I was like, <gasps> I looked everywhere for her. I was like, this is horrible. The, you one piece missing. And thank God it wasn't a thousand because she came home. And I said, I only do a thousand piece puzzles. And that's the worst thing ever to be like, when you get to the end, Jesus, you know, and you crawl around your hands and knees. You never drop a piece and not stop and pick it up. Because Coleman, who's the robot, I'm sure he ate it. So he was fixing to get a lobotomy by Sherry. Because I'm like, we have to find this piece. Oh my gosh, yeah. And so it's not, okay, but see, we look at ourselves in the body and we think that's not important. It is important that one piece be missing because we don't have all the parts supplying one another and we don't even have the whole picture of the military assignment God has given us. And so you're either doing one of two things. There's always two sides of a coin. You have to decide what you're on. You're either being uh, self-absorbed about what you think you want and not recognizing that you were placed in the body, or you're on the other ditch, both are ditches saying, well, I don't really have value. God's greatest pleasure that you can ever give him is to believe him. The greatest pain you will ever cause him is to doubt him. And when you say, I have a hard time believing about me what God said, you are causing him great pain. You don't have to understand what he said about you. You don't have to feel it. You can just accept it by faith. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you believe in me more than I believe in me. And I'll just keep agreeing with you, and eventually I may feel it. But if I don't, sir, life goes on. So that, that's one of our problems is we're waiting to feel everything and you're feeling a whole lot of things that God is not interested in you feeling that are not helping you down the path. They're taking you off the path because feelings were not given to you to lead you. They were given to you by God. He made them, but they were not given as the leader. And when you make them the leader, they lead you all right, but never in the right direction. And I mean, never. You can use the, the N word on that. Amen. Okay, uh, we know 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, God places us in the body as he chooses, which means if you see a quote on Instagram that says, go out and find your church, eh, false doctrine. God places you in the body as he sees fit, not as you see fit. I'm glad I could take that off my shopping list. Right? Oh, good. One less thing I have to think about, pray about, figure out, and do. Thank you, sir. Just tell me where to go, and, and, and we'll commence to getting there, right? Even if I got to leave an unsold house with the for sale sign in the yard, which I have done twice to be where God told me to be, and with no money to be there. Yeah. You can have what you want, but you'll forfeit what you desire. And we know in Ephesians 4.16, it says the body joined together, building itself up. So much of your building comes from receiving from others and being allowed to impart into them. The building up, the body must be together. Do you see why we are not to forsake the assembling in one place, in this place, in this room for this church, and 
the other churches, whatever their room is, um, because all these things are happening, like the things I said stand up, and all these moving parts, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the body, working together, connecting, giving a supply to each other, and receiving the supply builds up the entire body so we can come together Sunday and receive more instruction. Why? to just repeat this cycle. And it builds up a body stronger and stronger and stronger. And then they are truly unified. So when they come in, they hear with the same ears and then they can move as a unit. When they train a military unit, why, why we have basic training or boot camp. Boot camp means you want to try to stay out of the way of the boot. <laughs> There's a reason for all these things. And so uh, you're gonna, you don't want to get the boot <laughs> temporarily and permanently. Uh, basic training is so that you can have one thought and one mind and one mouth. And that what, what, by whatever means necessary, we will help you achieve that in the next eight weeks. Whether you prefer to run extra miles or hope you brought an extra toothbrush for latrine cleaning, um, they conform you to one thought process, why? Because you don't move as an individual. Even in special forces, you move as a unit. Every member of a special forces team has a different skill, but it doesn't work alone. That team is put together so that it works in tandem to complete the mission they were giving. There are no lone rangers out there on a special forces team. And so they go beyond basic training to specialized training. Why? If they have a specialized mission, right? And so that requires additional training. But if we don't even show up for basic training, we cannot be trained. I'm sorry, everybody, attention, get up right now off your couches and go run five. How does that work? It, it, it doesn't work to be trained. Training is done in person. Uh, mentorship is done in person, side by side. People were assigned to people to train them. When you train somebody at work, you show them what to do. You're with them. You're talking to them. Uh, you're demonstrating to them. You're taking oversight. You check up on that. It's a symbiotic relationship. Amen. It's not just, here's this book. Go read it and do it. I know sometimes people will try that, but it doesn't work out well. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay, as the manner of some is, in other words, so you have good habits and bad habits. This verse is saying the habit, the bad habit of some people that got worse after COVID is not to show up in person. God is saying that's a bad habit. That's not going to help you. It's not going to make you, uh, and we, have, we forget oftentimes, and how we forget it is we forget three-part being. I know spirit, soul, and body, but servant, son, soldier. We go, we go to the beach because we go, I'm a son. I'm royalty, and I think I'll treat myself like one. Where's the servant and where's the soldier, the other two parts? But we want sermons on sonship. Those are wonderful sermons. That is who we are. But that it make, being a son makes you no less a servant or a soldier. The king's sons serve in the army. And they go from the bottom up through the ranks, even if it's officer training school, it's still school, okay? And so as, the, as is in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, that means encouraging by calling near, calling aloud, inviting. So if people are inviting you often to come, that would be a sign to you. <laughs> Let this be a sign to you. You must not be present. If you are getting post texts on your Facebook or whatever and saying, come to this service or whatever, then are you present enough to not get the post? Because when the ones that are present are posting for others that maybe aren't even a part of a sheepfold or, or part of a body, or again, uh, people that are unsaved because that's we're outreach minded. We're not asking people from other churches to come to this church. They have to be put where God has placed them. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're to call and invite, beg urgently, and so much more means a greater degree as we see the day approaching. Now, that day is a period of time. The day is an, uh, when the Bible says day, yes, it can mean a 24-hour day. That would be literal, but most of the time that word is used in a figurative sense as we see the day, the last days approaching. 
Why does it look like it's approaching us when we're moving towards it? Because when you're moving towards something, don't you have the sense that it's closer to you? Yeah, when you're in a car, you're like, oh, that's coming closer to me. The truth is you're coming closer to it. And so, uh, but that word, this is so interesting because as you see the day, the period of time that's made ready, remember at the end of time, acceleration happens. Why? Because the sand falls faster through that, that little thing. It speeds up. They've measured it. The, when it's full, it, it goes slower. The, the ones at the bottom go faster. And so we have an accelerated, approaching, come near. That word, it means in the Greek, throttle, curved arm or hand. I love the word throttle. You ever heard the expression? It, maybe this is an older one. Depends on who your parents or grandparents were. I'm going to throttle you, boy. <laughs> James, I bet you heard that a lot. I don't know if they said that in Polk County, but if they do, that would have been, I'm sure what was said. <laughs> but now you do the saying, right? Yeah, Mr. James is like, oh, that's my favorite word. Yeah, I'm going to throttle you. So <laughs> throttle kind of meant like, I'm going to choke them or you get them in a headlock. You were, you were going to squeeze something. Like you either get over here or I'm going to throttle you over, over here. But when I think of the word throttle, because I wasn't raised in Polk County, I think of uh, the throttle on a F-14. I just do. And so the throttle is, a, is something that you uh, can pull back for acceleration of direction. And so what God says is basically in the Greek, this means uh, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as you see the day approaching. That word throttle means an outstretched curved arm that did this. Throttle. God is pulling back on the throttle. What is he doing? He's here facing you in time. He's at the end of time, at the end of your life. He's already created it. And you are here moving towards him, and he is doing this. He is pulling time. Amen. He is pulling the fabric of time to himself. This is the last era which the harvest must be reached. The reason we have to assemble together is for continual training to be harvesters. Also that we don't fall away. The Bible says there'll be a great falling away and you'll fall out in darkness, but you need to allow yourself to be throttled in the correct direction and accelerated. And I know for some people's personalities, that's very uncomfortable. Buttercup. You know what to do, yeah. <laughs> um, you're gonna bring that in. But I wanna read something to you. Are you there in, in Hebrews 10, 25? There are a couple verses after this that we usually don't get to, but let's talk about them. After we talk about don't forsake the assembling or the admonishing of yourselves together. Let me see if I wanna uh, read this. I'm gonna read this in the King James. For if we sin, verse 26, willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite the spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, vengeance belongeth to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people." It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used." For you had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourself that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise." For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. 
Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in, in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. The word perdition means to draw back into loss and destruction. So when we draw back from the command of assembling ourselves together more, as we see the day approaching, our drawing back is to our own loss and our own destruction. And we're like, well, what about that vacancy in the body? Thank God for the law of replacement because God will send another person to the spot uh, in that military unit, the law of replacement. But it would be better for us to be the replacement than to be the replaced. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, like Paul is saying, we are not of them. So I would recommend that being a new motto. I am not of them that that draw back. And he's he's articulating the fact that you'll have challenges. He said, you'll have challenges because you're not drawing back. And then you'll have challenges because you're associating with people that won't draw back. And we all thought association with our pastor would be a cakewalk. (laughs) Yeah, ever been on the deck of an aircraft carrier when one was taken off? Yeah, you know, the backdraft that we're all trying to hook on to? A little hot, huh? Okay, so it's, it's not all a cakewalk, but it's beneficial. And he says, don't cast your confidence away. What? Your confidence that you're doing the right thing even when you see nothing and feel nothing changing. Yeah. Don't cast that away because it has a great reward. That means it's gonna take time. And one thing, he said, you have need of patience. Not only is it one of the fruit of the Spirit, It's on the inside of us, but don't let yourself become more impatient because society is more impatient. We're so impatient that we make coffee nervous because it's not making fast enough. (laughs) Hurry up. Like, isn't this fast food? Yeah, I like my stuff the same day I ordered it. (laughs) Um, We we can't yield to that because it's going to affect us spiritually. Amen? Amen. So go with me uh, to Acts chapter 2. You okay? We're just taking our sweet time. So remember, we confess that we thank God for the stretch. Aren't you glad? Stretching us. That that means um, that throttle is coming back. Aren't you glad we don't respond to the word with our personality? Okay, these things. uh, The word is the great equalizer. Amen? Acts 2, let's, let's go to verse 42. So what are we talking about? Showing up. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So there are several things. When you show up, there is a right way and a wrong way to show up. And there are things that we do and that we don't do when we're present. Amen? And so... um, There are things they did. That word fellowship, what we call fellowship is kind of like, that's the fellowship hall. That's where we come in early, have coffee. I don't feel like talking to anybody, so I'm not gonna come have fellowship. That's not the word fellowship as it's intended, koinonia in the Greek, amen? So that word fellowship means a sharer and a participant in partnership. So when I come in the building, it doesn't matter if I don't feel like talking to somebody, that selfishness. There are other people that need to be listened to. Yeah, we come in here to be a sharer in participating in partnership. That means if the toilet needs to be unstopped or a baby's diaper needs to be changed or the front uh, stoop needed to be swept off or uh, the offering buckets need to be cast, we came in here not to get. We understood that anything we sowed, we would receive but that and that only. We came in here to give, to be a fellowship, a participator. So if we're not participating, you're missing out on one of the major supplies that God designed for his body to have in our lives. And you may not even know you're missing out on it because if you knew what you were missing out on, you'd stop missing out on it. because it's not about what you feel like you need or don't need. How about somebody else? You know, uh, one thing I love about the mission field, um, normally it's a nine-day trip. This is a super short trip. I love nine days to forget about myself. Aren't you sick of thinking about yourself literally day and night? Yeah. 
what you want, what you don't want, how you feel, how you don't feel, what you want to eat, what you what somebody was somebody done for me lately <laughs> or hasn't done for you. Yeah, I love what I call the luxury of singular focus. There will be people that will die and go to hell if I don't do my job. And so, no, I'm not getting crushed ice in my drink. There is no ice. God help you if you drink it. <laughs> Literally, only God. I recommend you not. Yeah. Like, can we not live without ice? Right? But, but we want to whine and complain about these things when people's lives are on the line and they don't really care about ice. They would just like something to eat today. And so I appreciate those moments when I can remind myself, Marie, why don't you just act like that every day you're in America? Yeah, and remind myself what I teach in the character class. This is more than I deserve, so this will be perfect when they serve me my coffee cold and I have to go and nuke it in the past. <laughs> I have to go in the office and go, yeah, I got my coffee, but I have to microwave it because it was cold. So what, right? Um, the, these are opportunities. When, when I come in this church, every service, prayer, Wednesday night, I love the chance to forget about me. I love to drop the baggage outside the door Please keep your junk in your trunk. <laughs> because uh, isn't it refreshing? Yeah, the most boring subject in the universe is me. And I would say second is you. <laughs> You're like, oh, you thought I was going to say you. That, that's up for you to decide, yeah. <laughs> and so um, that participation, and notice that they did three things there. Correct, followed correct doctrine. They shared in the work responsibilities and ate. That went together. So when we work together, we eat together a lot. We like to eat. You know, we eat at, at staff meetings or whatever. So the people that are working together are the ones that are fellowshipping and, and eating together and breaking a bread. And then prayers. So there are three things that they did to consider themselves connected and staying on course. Amen? So... Uh, this is the helps team. This is why we have a helps team here so that people can serve in many capacities. They can serve pre-services, during services, post-services, during the week, outreaches, all kinds of places so that they get the opportunity. It's not our job to force people. It's our job to provide for what the word said. But um, if I cook for you and you don't show up and eat, I have no problem throwing that in the trash, yeah but don't think I'll do it a second time. Yeah, how many But how many of your mama, when she cooked and the food was hot, if you were like, dinner, if she said dinner's ready and you said, I'll be there in a minute, something, a freight train, train went through your door right then and got all over you like white on rice. So when, when God is serving up food, we don't, we don't say, oh, I got something better to do. Amen. There's no better place. Amen. There's no better thing in my week. No work, nothing. And I've had to use faith. It is okay to use your faith before finances, before healing, to alter your work schedule so that you are in the place God told you to be in. There are many times I have had to use my faith to be in this place. I have had to move dirt, move earth, move heaven and earth to get it done. Because I said, I will be like David. I made that decision in my early 20s when in an all-night prayer session, sitting by my chair, I saw in my Bible at Tampa Worship Center that David said, I would desire to be in your house all the days of my life. I wasn't even on my way to Bible school, much less ministry. I, had, I didn't know nothing from nothing. I said, that's me. Amen. And not because he was the king. But I said, I don't really know what that means, but I want to be in your house all the days of my life. So I will move earth and I will skip eating and I will let my boss fire me. Respectfully, sir, I will not be able to work on Sunday. Sir, I understand if you must let me go, I will have to trust God. Amen. I will cook French fries seven days a week, 24 hours a day, as long as I'm here on Sunday. There's nothing beneath me. And when you, you have that priority, that I will be in my father's house as, as a son, but a soldier and a servant. Amen. Every opportunity I get, and I'm there to serve his people and happy to do it because of all he's done for me. I will wash my own mouth out with soap before I ask God for another doggone blessing when I am not interested in other people's blessing. If I have that level of mitigated gall, as my mama would say, I will get my own Irish spring bar soap. That was especially tasty. 
<laughs> My sons would tell you that too. <laughs> Smells real good. <laughs> Tastes terrible. How much do you think God would just do for us if we would just honor him for all he's already done? There are so many times my natural father will say, what can I do for you? Daddy, if I lived two lifetimes, I could never pay you back for what you've already done. I just want to so be with you. What can I do for you? So how many times do we go with our long laundry list of prayers? Worse than that, demands of God himself in heaven, that he do more and more and more and more. But do we ever go into the house of God? How may I serve you? Is there anything you need today? I, I don't cook, and if I did, you might not want to eat it, but I do know where to get good food. Yeah, I do know where they have the best pizza, you know, and I can uh, Uber it or Uber it myself or whatever. So it's like, it's so simple. And if we were just about that, in this assembling together and fellowship, never thinking about what we need or want. Do you understand that that would be so overflowing you never would have to think about what you need or want again because God uh, wants to take care of you Amen. more than you wanna be taken care of. But he's not interested in just taking care of you. He's interested in being such a good daddy to you that you have so much you can't help but give it away. Amen. He wants you to have more than enough, not to hoard it. He's not looking for hoarders. He's looking for sharers and he's looking for givers. Hoarding means I believe that there won't be enough. Okay, hoarding is not a supply. Hoarding is not prosperity. Hoarding means you lack faith of the worst kind. Do we need three of those? Have you, did you even know you had three of those? Get rid of them. Yeah, it's just stuff. It's junk, amen? You okay? What time is it? Oh, we're okay. A few more minutes. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes. We're only going to get to point one. We're still talking about showing up. <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> now, this is good. I, I told the Lord I would not rush. So we'll, we'll do all four other points tonight. <laughs> Come with your body armor. It'll be a drive-by fruiting. Yeah. Ecclesiastes 5.1. We're talking about showing up, but you know how you show up matters. I love this verse. It says, keep your foot when you go to the house of God. We're like, weird saying, no, <laughs> not really. Keep your foot, and the Amplified says, as Jacob to sacred Bethel. Give your mind to what you're doing is what it means. Keep your foot means to give your mind to what you're doing. How many of you have ever been present in body but absent in mind? Yeah, or we're like, anybody ever run into a meeting like, oh my God, oh, I'm here, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and your boss or me are looking at you like, now it's gonna take 10 minutes for you to exhale and get all your stuff together. The best thing to do is do that outside the meeting door and don't come in like the house is on fire or like we've landed at home base and we're, you know, the boss is gonna go safe because <laughs> now we're gonna be like, Okay, collect your faculties. When we enter the house of God, when we get up in the morning, when we go to work, let's have our mind and our body in the same location. Would that be good? <laughs> and our, how about our heart? Spirit, soul, and body, all present and all working together. Spirit leading, right? Amen. Okay, so it says, keep your foot, keep your mind on what you're doing when you go to the house of God. For to draw near to hear and obey is better than to give the sacrifice of fools. Too ignorant to know that they are doing evil. That means fools come into God's house. God said it, I didn't. There are fools. I'm sure no one here today. Fools come in not knowing why they came in or what they're doing. They're not keeping their foot. They're going, oh my God, I made it. I just got out of the... Tension up, strife up, come in the door. Everything's about them. Oh, hair's a mess. What a day. So take a minute in the car to collect all your faculties, spirit, soul, and body, and to leave your junk in the trunk and go, I are a servant. Come in to serve. Okay, and dismiss whatever just happened. We all have to do it, every single one of us. Pa give a cause. I'm giving you a cause for pause in the parking lot. Yeah, so if... People don't sit in their cars during church or after church. That's a security no-no. But if we find you sitting in your car prior to church, I'll tell security, leaveth you aloneeth. 
<laughs> Just do this. That means I'm taking a cause for pause, collecting everything. Uh, he said that uh, keep your foot. Know what you're going in there to do. Don't enter as a fool. And what that means, a fool is careless and they are casual about what they're doing, right? Not us, right? We're going to show up the right way. And it says a tag on to that um, in Genesis 35 is the tag. Uh, what they were saying is when it says, how has Jacob came to Bethel? What they did when Jacob came to Bethel, they did two things. They put away all their idols. Let me recommend you put away the idol called your cell phone. Turn it off and tuck it away. It's an idol. If you have it out during church, it's, a, it's an idol to you. Pastor's not here. I can say what I want. <laughs> he told me to be nice. That's such a broad definition. <laughs> yeah. Good luck defining that. No. Um, he said they put, put away their idols and they washed themselves and changed their clothes. It is okay. It's very important how you come in here with your best. Yeah. Take, take a shower, whatever. And I know people come from work and they have to change in the bathroom for school, whatever. That's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the attitude behind that, right? Just going, uh, you know, I'm going to go to the beach afterwards. I'll come in my beach attire. Yeah, that's what the Queen of Sheba was so impressed with, right? Their Hawaiian shirts and their holy shorts and hairy feet and flip-flops. Yeah, no. Um, there, people that had, had heard that God was good came in and saw, saw, saw the wisdom, saw the goodness. It's tangible, not felt, saw it. Amen. Okay, so when they walk in that foyer and it looks like a palace or a castle in Scotland, that's what it's supposed to look like. It's not supposed to look like a funeral parlor with scuffed up walls and fake fica trees. Yeah, there will never be a fake FICA tree in this building. <laughs> not, not during my uh, lifetime, and I will put it in my will if I need to. Because <laughs> somehow that just does not belong. I don't think the Queen of Sheba was wowed by your dusty ficus. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to keep our foot. So we're going to put away our idols. An idol is whatever you put in front of God. Yeah, that's right. That means, that's why I give cause for pause, me can be my biggest idol, and I'm going to leave that in my car. I'm going to put aside everything that I'm doing, thinking, needing, wanting, feeling, and leave it in my car before I enter here because I will not have anything in front of me. I will not, have any, I will not show up to the house of God and actually bring my idol into the temple. Amen. We think the Old Testament has gone away. Jesus said, I didn't do away with that. I fulfilled it. They didn't act like that then. We need to not be acting like that now. Amen? Amen? Okay. And so they put aside their proper garments. Why? They were told this was holy ground. So showing up is important, but how we show up matters. Uh, Luke 4, 16 says this was Jesus' custom, and we are to be just like him. Uh, how we conduct ourselves. I remember one time I was in class uh, and it was eighth grade, and in, uh, by private school, they had uh, cubicles. A lot of schools will have double-wide cubicles uh, because they don't have enough building space, and so the school is expanding. So the eighth grade classroom was out in one of the cubicles, and I don't remember what subject, but this teacher was very memorable. And, and this, this teacher had a, had a, a way about her. Um, she did not have to express herself verbally, and she did not have to even change her face. When you were dismissed, you got the finger of dismissal. And she may not even look at you. There was no energy exerted of any kind. Why? Because she the boss. She commanded her classroom. And when the finger of dismissal came, the, there better be silence and there better be movement. <laughs> and so this was the teacher. I'm on the front row. And so there's probably the, the normal little desks, you know, that you sit in. And th this particular desk, they were square, you know, where your books go in it. The seat was attached. So it was one unit. Your desk and your chair were together. And we had a, at least four of us across. And so I'm sitting here, and, and the door 
is right there. Her desk is there, and there's somebody next to me. But uh, my classmate, it was Kim, and I don't remember her last name, but you remember she was really short. Um, it's dead silent, you know, and you have, you're studying, you're reading, you're doing whatever. The teacher is sitting at her desk, and she's reading something. And all of a sudden, out of my peripheral vision, slowly, in slow motion, I'm positive. I'm sure it didn't happen in slow motion, but it looked like slow motion. All of a sudden, Kim, in her desk, and in slow motion, the whole thing as a unit went forward, and she's in it. Nobody breathed, moved, and she didn't say or do anything. And I'm seeing this, and this teacher says, you, were, you didn't turn your head very often either to look at anything. <laughs> and so she gets out. The teacher says nothing. She sets her desk back up and sits in it. I am a visual learner, the slightly photographic memory. It was more photographic than it needs coffee assistance now. <laughs> and you're not allowed to speak, breathe, move. I feel it coming up. I am doing everything I can because this is now a home movie and this movie is on a reel-to-reel and it is just my mind. How, why, what, you know, what, just everything. The questions are going and I am, I am just, I can feel it now. Straining and restraining. And you didn't fidget in your seat. You didn't start making all kinds of noise with your paper, or whatever. Deep breathing. I am just, it hurts. I mean, it hurts. I, I am holding it in. And it's getting worse and worse. My heart's starting to pound. It's starting to, you know, it's coming up like when the joy's starting to hit you and you're trying not to let it ride. And, uh, I'm thinking, I'm gonna, uh, this is going to not be good. And so <laughs> I've done doing everything in my power. I think tears are running down my face. I was sweating. I don't sweat. And um, I let fly. It was impossible. It was the volcano in your sixth grade science experiment. The law of inevitable eventuality. The whole movie just... And I have that personality that I'm like, are you okay? And if I can ask you that through the laughter. <laughs> because... Your injuries are very funny to me, as long as <laughs> horrible. I don't get the dumb and dumber thing, but I kind of get the dry humor thing. And so I have exploded with laughter. I just, I don't even wait for the finger of dismissal. I just get up and just go out the door and go to the principal's office. <laughs> Mama said, three, way, three things happen. You did it, fess up, you get less whoopings. You did it and lie about it, you know, or if I, somebody else tells me, number two, it's worse for you. Number three, you lie about it, I'll kill you and make another one just like you. So I'm walking to the principal's office. I walk right in there and said, I'm so sorry. I couldn't, this is what I did. So I just told him, because mama said it would go well for you if we stay on number one. I didn't need the teacher to go after class and then come haul me out of class because we had corporal punishment. <laughs> <laughs> and be, somehow the principal did not, I was paddled on more than one occasion, uh, uh, did not paddle me because I just walked right, right out the door, you know, howling down the side, <laughs> sidewalk, <laughs> going, I'm just going to go straight to the principal's office, compose myself and be like, oh, this is excessive. To this day, I can see, and I, I'm sure there was a creaking noise. What am I saying? <laughs> There's a way to conduct yourself in the house of God, and that's not it. <laughs> no, actually, that, that is more it. But when we show up, uh, it matters how we show up, amen, and reverencing the thing of God. So I wanted, it was such a heavy one, I wanted to end on a, a fun note. So with that, stand with me. Thank you for joining us today. To learn more about the ministry and get additional resources, you can visit us at jackmyersministries.com and lifefamilychurch.net.